Good evening, this is Pastor Barbara, a.k.a. Preacher with Parrots. Today is the 25th of February, 2015. Uh, we're live on our Wednesday night Bible study on iVlog.tv. Uh, you can join us there anytime you'd like to on uh, Wednesday evening and Sunday evening and Sunday morning. Times on the West Coast, uh, Sunday is... Uh, 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. and on Wednesday 7 p.m. If you're someplace other than on the West Coast, we'll let you do the math. I see we've got another visitor that's popped up. Welcome visitor whose uh, number ends in 1-1. I see you know your way around the network because you've already figured out the, uh, the emotions. <laughs> Glad to have you here with us. We're in the uh, 27th uh, book, a uh, chapter of the book of Proverbs, and we will finish the book of Proverbs tonight. Uh, one that I had just read, it said, An let another one praise you and not your own mouth. Let someone else and not your own lips. When I was 18 years old and in Bible college, I was being paid, I think, $15 a month, uh, along with an, an, another older, uh, more advanced, I think she was a senior, uh, student and uh, after a couple of years in that church they had put my name up to receive some type of a credential and uh, I, I've told some of you have heard me say this before hi back at you <laughs> and um, I, I got this letter I was in a different college for my fourth year but the mail caught up with me, and in absence, in absentia, I had been granted a license to preach. So mail came, Reverend Barbara Shelton, and oh man, 19, I had just turned 19, and uh, I was a reverend. <laughs> I started signing my mail, and the superintendent of the Bible College became aware of it and said, look, Barbara, you don't do that. You let others call you nice words and things like that. You don't push yourself. And uh, I've learned a lot. Um, a number of years went by before the 61 years in ministry that I now count uh, actually began. This was like four years before that. Um, but I was a kid and um, I had a lot to learn. And that's what the book of Proverbs is. Uh, the difference between the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes, which we will do next, is that uh, Solomon was much younger and he was writing to youth. By the time he gets around to writing Ecclesiastes, uh, okay, <laughs> uh, you're in London? No, oh, that's okay. I don't care whether you sign in or not. <laughs> uh, that's all right. And we have another two that just signed in, 61, 58, 88, and 11. We have four guests. Uh, welcome to all of you. I am making a video, so if time goes by, you type something up there. Your London, London preacher. <laughs> yes, I've got I think three people, maybe four from London. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, if I don't answer your your um, comment or something right away, it is because I am making a video of this portion of the. But don't feel bad. You understand if I don't get to your question or comment right away. All right, so anyway, I've learned a lot, and, and that's what the book of Proverbs is, is to teach really practical things. When I finish with tonight, I'm going to add some other things, which I call practical Proverbs, because they're the type of Proverbs I think we need to give young people information about now. Anyway, um, to bring us a couple more proverbs to bring us up to where we're going to start tonight. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. 
to love somebody and never tell them, somebody who doesn't know they're loved. Um, open rebuke. If a young person needs to be corrected, whether they're your child, your grandchild, uh, a student that you, the teacher for, if, if you're somebody's mentor, uh, rebuke isn't always pleasant. But if it's given in the right way and if it's received in the right way, it's good. Probably one of the biggest problems I have are looking at somebody that I know and I know a little piece of advice I could give them that would help them so much in getting along with other people or finding a job or getting into the right college. And I know, I know they're not quite ready to receive it yet. And it's a battle that I have within myself. Do I take a chance and tell them, and if they're not ready for it, they're going to be hurt by it and not helped? Um, I've worked with people younger than me most of my life, and now, of course, everybody's younger than me. I'll, I went to a doctor today, a doctor I had never seen before, but my doctor wasn't available, and they assigned me one. And she says, boy, for your age, you look good, and you sound good, and you do good. And I said, yeah, thanks. You know, I am older than 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 everybody. Uh, but sometimes you just know that with a tiny bit of advice, if maybe if somebody would just stop doing one thing that you know irritates people, and you can forgive them because you love them, but you know that a whole lot of people they run into are not going to be forgiving them. And wow, just not knowing, I'm I'm afraid they're not quite ready to hear this yet. If I told them this yet and they took it in the wrong way, they wouldn't realize the way it was meant. It wouldn't be good. Better a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. We don't choose our family. We do choose our friends. And sometimes, maybe if we have family that we're close to family-wise and love-wise, but not close to distance-wise, we would like to be closer to, but hey, if there's somebody there, ready to, like somebody that knew I hadn't been quite as strong after a bout with a fever, uh, offered to uh, come up the mountain and drive me down to the doctor and back. That was nice. Uh, somebody may not be family, they may not be close, but it's a good proverb, better a neighbor nearby than a brother far away that can't be there when you need physical help. Well, that's where we ended last Wednesday. A quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy, on a rainy day. Um, I don't get dripping of rain here where I live because um, my my ceiling, I live in a mountain home and the ceiling, the, the roof is very high and I don't, and I have a lot of insulation and I don't get dripping. But I remember when I was a kid, uh, both in our home, which was very small, and when I was only 10, and that would be 74 years ago when I was 10, 70, almost 74 years ago, 73. Uh, I can remember all night and, you know, no television to watch, no everybody with a radio in their own room. On the farm, we had kerosene lamps. Uh, at least part of the time at night, we may have had electricity and it didn't always work. 
uh, but you just lay there until you went to sleep and drip, 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 drip. It, it happens sometimes when you're in your car. It can just nearly drive you crazy. Um, and it says a wife, but really anybody, any woman or even a child or a male that's constantly bugging, bugging, bugging. Same thing, same thing, over and over and over. A quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. I'm going to go over to um, chapter 28 now. And um, let me pull up this other Bible that I have here also and see if I've marked something in it that I didn't mark in this one. I, I did. I marked uh, verse 6. Better a poor man who lives with integrity than a rich man who distorts right and wrong. Integrity is such an important word with me. I didn't think about it too much or use the word myself personally too much until I moved up to the mountain and I met some people who knew me by reputation. They didn't know me personally. But um, because I'm with the Spanish-speaking branch mostly, and they were English, but they knew apparently people that knew me. And they said, oh, we know all about you. We hear you're a person of integrity. And from then on, it's, it seemed like I've heard the word used frequently. And it, it really means being honest in many, many, many ways. Honest in what you say. Honest in the way you deal with money. Honest in the way you treat people, uh, just being what people expect you to be. You can have integrity when you're a youth, and it's not as easily recognized because integrity, a person's reputation, takes a while to 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 to, to get a reputation, good or bad. And if somebody is just working their first job, if uh, somebody is in an early relationship, maybe their first boyfriend, their first girlfriend, um, you don't know whether sincere they're sincere when they, they say you're the only one I'm going with. It, a reputation, good or bad, takes a while to to get. Hi, Ninja. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. Sorry if I didn't see your name. I'm also uh, doing a video on um, YouTube. You can probably catch it there after the program tonight. So we don't know about a, a person, whether they have an integrity or not. But, you know, it's just like um, I talked to somebody today, and they mentioned that somebody had checked up on their credit and on their, I guess, to see if they had a police record or something. They had, they had applied for something, and they had been advised that they had passed these different uh, inquiries about themselves. Um, it takes a while to get credit. Uh, if you just get a credit card and pay when it's ah uh, thank you ninja this is, yeah the bird behind me is tweety it's the father uh the mother is sitting on well she's not a mother yet she, well maybe she is she's laid five eggs i guess she qualifies as mother uh all she can do now is sit on them 
uh, that we shall have we should have babies. Um, we could have babies um, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, but for sure we should have babies by Monday. And then we'll go a couple of days without any because she went a couple of days uh, uh, that she didn't lay after she laid the first one. Anyway, yeah, he's he's with me alone because she's in the cage. Um, so it takes a while to get a reputation. It takes a while to get a good credit rating. It takes a while to get a a, a good rating on on anything. You. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, a rich man is wise in his own eyes. But a poor man who has discernment sees through him. I question the way Solomon here has used the word um, wise. It says a, a rich man is wise in his own eyes. If you've never had anything and suddenly you strike a good deal, get a good job or whatever, youth have a harder time than middle-aged and older people in knowing what to do suddenly with money. Um, I, when I pastored a church, I uh, learned that some of my congregation got money monthly from the government. And they would buy the dumbest things on the first of the month when they had money, and they would be broke the last week. And literally, pickings on the table were not that good. Uh, not that they were wealthy, but have all that money together on the first of the of the month and first of all not have worked for it. It's a little hard. You know, money means more when you work for it, right? And you know you add up the hours and you know so much time went by how much you've earned you appreciate it a lot more when you work for it. But regardless, if somebody isn't used to dealing with money and, and, the, and, and there's once a month they've got a lot of it, they really have a hard time knowing how to handle it. But it says, a poor man, maybe this rich man is somebody who has inherited it and hasn't worked for it. Because it says a poor man who has discernment sees through him. A poor man that works very hard for everything he gets knows the value of a, of a buck, knows the value of a dime. Verse 13. The one who conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. I happened to hear something on television today. Uh, it was early in the morning, and there was a panel of ministers that were uh, discussing one of the books of the Bible. And they said something very accurate, very good, and they all agreed on it. They were talking about unconfessed sin. Uh, you know, everywhere in the Bible that it talks about sin, and it, it talks about confessing sin and admitting to your sin and asking forgiveness for your sin and then receiving forgiveness of your sin. One of them came up with this statement and it's very good and they all agreed with it and I agree with it. Unconfessed sin is unforgiven sin. An, another television personality who I think is right on on some things is Dr. Phil. Says you can't do anything about what you 
don't acknowledge. If you go on his program or any other self-help or let us help you type program, or even even this program that, that talks about faith and the Bible, if you don't acknowledge that you've sinned, or if you say such and such is not a sin, you're not going to confess it. And if you don't confess it, you don't get forgiven of it. And what one of these men said, and the others agreed to, unconfessed sin is unforgiven sin, is very good. You know what? I don't see Springfield, Spring, springtime here. I wonder how he's doing. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, verse 26. The one who trusts in himself is a fool. But one who walks in wisdom will be saved. Now, there's there's a lot that I could comment on that. We we self confidence is a good thing. To a point. When we think we're all that, or we think we know everything and there's nothing else we can learn, or we think, and I'm not talking about people who admit they feel this way, because most people won't admit it, because it doesn't sound good. But those who think they know everything, the one who trusts in himself is a fool. But the one who walks in wisdom will be safe. Trust in yourself. Trust in others. Trust in God. Let me see if I had marked anything. Mm, I think this is enough. Let me go now to chapter 29. Verse 2, when the righteous flourish, the people rejoice. When good people are blessed, I think everything, everybody is happy. Uh we hear about somebody's house breaking down and, and everybody getting together and helping them to fix it up and to refurnish it or uh, somebody's child is injured in an accident and there's no money to pay the hospital bill and everybody comes together and helps out. We like to see good people or well-deserving people be blessed. But when the wicked rule, people groan. We've got a lot of people groaning now, not only in the United States, but in other countries. Because there are too many countries that have leaders who are looking out for number one and not for the people that they either depending if they're a dictator, they either took over the rule of or whatever the case might be. A fool gives vent to an anger, but a wise man holds it in check. It's always a, fool, a, a, a foolish person who turns loose of their emotions, regardless of whatever those emotions are. They can't wait till tomorrow. You've heard about sleeping on a letter before you mail it. It used to be a lot easier to do that. Now, we don't make as many trips to the post office as we used to, and we've all got a computer that has a send key on it. Once you hit that, uh, 
it was a little easier to be wise because if you wrote a letter in the middle of the night, at least you had a little bit of time before the post office opened it. But it's always good to keep your thoughts to yourself until you know that it's your thoughts are something worth sharing. Without revelation, people run wild, but the one who keeps the law will be happy. On Sunday nights, we're in the book of Romans. Uh, Sunday night, and by the way, if you enjoy watching the birds, <laughs> watch Sunday night's video. The title of it is Is there a purpose to the law? Or is, is, is the Old Testament law any good for us today? Something like that. It's got the date on it is 2.28 p.m. And it has, the, the, the question is, because it comes up in the first few chapters of Romans, is the law any good? If some people don't keep the law, but they know the law, and what about those Gentiles? The law was never written for them. Some of them do a better job at keeping it than some of the Jews that had studied it all of their lives. Does the law have a purpose? The answer to the question Paul gives it in the book of Romans, yes, the law does have a purpose. Even though not everybody keeps it, even the one that say they're under law instead of under grace aren't doing too well keeping it. And people for whom the Old Testament law means nothing, they are keeping it. What is the value of the law? Paul explains. It's very simple. The law tells you what's right and what's wrong. That's all. It's not a keeper of record of who keeps the law and who doesn't. But without a law, what would you know what you were allowed to do or not allowed to do? So while the law, even for us Christians, is not a major part of our Bible study, it's not a big part of our lives because we're saved by faith and grace and not by Old Testament law, but it does. And if you look at the basic law, when I was doing the studies on, on homosexual sin, which is different from homosexuality, if you don't know that difference, you need to go to those first three videos on it. They're also on YouTube under um, All You Wanted to Know About Homosexuality 1, 2, and 3. There is a difference between being homosexual and committing homosexual sin. There are heterosexuals who commit homosexual sin. There are homosexuals uh, who are celibate and do not sin. So if you don't know that difference, uh, basically I made those tapes to clarify it so that in our thinking we wouldn't not supposed to be judging people anyway, but in our thinking, uh, we wouldn't be misjudging some people. Uh, it doesn't apply to everybody, maybe not even the majority, but I, I think they are videos um, that do teach us some things that you want to know. Um, A fool gives vent to his anger, but a wise man holds it in check. Without revelation, people run wild. So that's the value of the Old Testament law. The same language in Leviticus about a man shall not lie with a man is the exact same wording 2,000 years later 
from the Apostle Paul to Jews and Gentiles. Supposed to be to Jews, but there were no Jews in Rome at that time. The governor kicked them all out. Exact same language. Old Testament, New Testament. So the law does have usefulness. And in this case, as Malachi, I believe, third chapter, six verse says, I am God, I change not. He certainly doesn't. Because his revelation to Moses to write in the book of Leviticus is the same wording as his revelation to the Apostle Paul to write to the Romans. Without revelation, people run wild. Revelation is God telling somebody what to preach or what to write. The one who keeps the law will be happy. Do you see a man who speaks too soon? There we go again about not mailing the letter right away. Not opening our mouth. And I think I may have mentioned on a previous Wednesday. I could go up to almost anybody and say, Oh, I heard that you did such and such last for Friday. And immediately that person is going to tell me why they did it. <laughs> Not that there's even a suggestion that they did anything wrong. It's just that we're so sensitive and we want everybody to think well of us. And so, yeah, if somebody says, yeah, I did that, there's no need to rectify it or make it okay unless we're overly sensitive. Um, which, if we have confidence in ourselves, we probably wouldn't be. You see a man that speaks too soon? There's more hope for a fool than for him. Just... Keep your thoughts to yourself until you've had a chance to let them gel. I usually say sometimes when I do something or say something stupid or too soon, something that I should have thought over, I will say that I've got my uh, brain in, I've got my actions in gear before my brain is, in gear something to that nature. An angry man stirs up conflict. And a hot-tempered man increases rebellion. Anger is not a verb until you do something about it. Usually if you keep your mouth shut and don't make decisions and don't do stuff till some time has gone by, even a foolish man is going to come out making a better decision. A person's pride will humble him, but a humble spirit will gain honor. A person who thinks they're all that, they're really, and, and, and we tend to. And unfortunately, I think we are misguiding our youth without meaning to. We want to take the poor among us and make them feel worthy. We want to take the underprivileged and let them know that we think they're important. And we have a high concept of them. And so... 
we started out by saying God made you and God don't make junk. You're special. And everybody is, especially children. And especially the underprivileged need to be reminded that they're special. But to a point, when we allow anybody, a child, a youth, an adult, anybody, to think they're all that, and because they're all that, they can do whatever they want to do, we're not accomplishing what our goal was. We're accomplishing something okay by making people say, well, I got rights. You know, you got to like me. No, I don't. <laughs> might not be able to discriminate against um, your religion or... Uh, the color of your skin in giving you a job or in making housing available to you. But we do have to cut off in some things. Not everybody wants to live next to a crook. Um, so we need some moderation in some of these things. Going to um, chapter 30. Let me go over here to this other Bible. We are now on the sayings of Agur. Um, the sayings of Agur, son of Jacob, and Oracle. Brilliant sayings. I am the most ignorant of men. I do not have a man's understanding. And by the way, these are much longer than the uh, we were given for a number of chapters. The good does this, the evil does this. Or the good man does this, and this will be the result. Sort of like a two-thought, a two-sentence type thing. These are much longer. These are more like a paragraph. Uh, I am the most ignorant of men. I do not have a man's understanding. He's speaking as a youth. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Not all that smart. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? In other words, who is so qualified to tell us all about heaven? Who has gathered up the wind in the hollow of his hand? Well, actually, who has? God has, not us. Some of these are going to be comparing our learning with God's learning. And when we get into the book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to find that even more so. Those are the words of Solomon after he has fallen into sin. And how did Solomon fall into sin because he had all these wives many of them were gifts that were given to him as king you think we just give queens gold crowns and diamond necklaces <laughs> in those days they often gave them wives or concubines and they were all from different countries what was the problem with marrying people from different countries. You marry people with different gods. You marry people from a different culture. But mainly, all of these women led him astray. And Solomon, who started out so well, 
eventually even built altars to false gods and so forth. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in the hollow of his hands? Who has wrapped up the waters in his cloak? You can't wrap up water in a cloth. The cloth soaks it up. Who has established all the ends of the world? Only God the Father and God the Son said, Let there be light and there was light. Let the dry ground be separated from the waters of the sea. Let us make man in our image. That's who has established the ends of the earth. What is his name and the name of his son? Tell me if you know. This is getting a little deeper. Every word of God is flawless. No mistakes. <laughs> I, did I use the word uh, crook? Yeah, I said, who wants to live next to a crook, didn't I? And you say, so judgmental. Why don't I call them undocumented possessor? <laughs> That's good. That's good, dog, dog way. Two things I ask of you, O Lord. Do not refuse me them before I die. Keep the falsehood and the lies from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Wow, that's, that's deep. Don't give me poverty. That's an obvious prayer. Don't give me riches. We go back to the meaning of the eye of the needle. It's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than a camel through the eye of a needle. The eye of a needle is like an extra large doggy door. It's a door within a city gate. When cities, in order to be kept safe, were walled. And they had one or more, Jerusalem has 12 doors or gates to the city. But the only safe place to be at night was within a walled city. And if your camel sprained his ankle or whatever and you were late getting to the walled city that was going to be your protection for the night and you couldn't get in because at dusk the gates are closed. But there was something called the eye of a needle. And it was like a doggy door. I'm 5'4 now because I've shrunk. <laughs> but I used to be 5'5 five, five and a half. And I had to bow my head a little bit to get into it. The Doggy door doesn't go all the way down to the, the very bottom. It comes up like about here. So while well, I'm bowing my head this way, I'm stepping my foot up. Uh, I suppose if all goes well and I do get to Jerusalem at the time I want to go this year, I will see how it is for a five foot four person to go through the eye of a needle because Jerusalem does have one uh, gate that has uh, eye of a needle in it. Uh, Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to go to heaven 
than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. A camel can do it. I could do it. A camel uh, that's young enough has developed arthritis or whatever camels develop when they get old. It can be done. You know the camel's biggest problem? What makes it the hardest for a camel to get through the eye of a needle through that doggy door is his attitude. Physically, you know, they can get their heads down. Physically, they can lift up their feet. Physically, it can be done. It's wide enough. You know, they're going to touch both sides of their belly against the side of the, the, the doggy door. But it can be done. Just remember that Camels are not known for having good breath or good attitude. And camels are like donkeys. They don't want to do what they don't want to do. And you can pull them, you can push them, but you can't push one through. And so it, it simply means it can be done, but it's hard. And not too many are going to make it. And it's not going to be because of the physical impossibility, in my opinion. In my opinion, having been through one of those doors, it's, and, and also having been front and center with a camel a couple times in my life, uh, what a camel don't want to do, a camel don't want to do. Um Two things I ask of you. Keep falsehood and lies from me and give me neither poverty nor riches. Nobody's going to ask God for poverty. Even priests who take a vow of poverty are taking a vow within a church who looks out after their priests. I don't personally know any priests, nor have I personally heard of any priests who have suffered poverty. They take a vow of poverty, and they do not become the owners of things. But I've never known them to join an order and not have food on the table and not have... A decent place to spend the night. So while we don't ask for poverty, uh, it says, give me neither poverty nor riches. You get rid of it. You get used to riches. Think you can't get along without it. Get an attitude. Not a good thing. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you, talking to God. I might disown God and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal. And so dishonor the name of my God. Um... These are the things that are never satisfied. Four, three things. Now he's adding another one, making it four. Enough the grave. We're not looking forward to that. The barren womb, the woman who cannot have children. That which is never... Uh, Land which is never satisfied with water. Land that's so dry you can't do anything with it. You can't grow anything. You can't live there. And fire. None of those ever say enough. There are three things that are too amazing and four. 
He's adding another one that I don't understand. The way of an eagle in the sky. Uh, we have one more month of eagles here on the mountain. The eagles that come to the San Bernardino Forest come from around Montana um, and those places. They've, they've got tags on them. They come the same ones. Um, I don't know if the ones that come here to Lake Arrowhead have names. There are four that always come to uh, the next town up. Well, one more town up, Big Bear. And they are Lucy and Ricardo, and then Lucy and Ricky's neighbors. They're, they've got marks marks on them. Uh, uh, they have been ticketed or right, something on them. They always come here. Uh, they're here until um, toward the end of March, and then they leave and they go back. Uh, we do have winter here, but much, much milder than they do in the northern part of the United States. Um, I, I think um, the large birds, like the eagles, are equally amazing to watch because they drift on... Uh, they're lifted, first of all, to... Um, wind that moves and they move along with it and they don't they when they get there they don't flap they flap their wings in order to gain height and that's why my birds all have the flight feathers uh, cut off I'd show you on him but he's got his what he was opening his wing just then uh, I have kind of evened it out so that you can't see that I've cut the flight wings. But they are about, in this kind of bird, about five feathers. Uh, with Captain and Kiki, more like seven or nine. Those are the, if you look at the back of a bird and you see where they cross over, you see that this bird up here, uh, it, you look at him from the back, he does not have wings, the flitters that cross over like this, his are cut off because those are the flights that are cut off. So you can't see it on any of my birds, but you will see some on wild birds. If you look at them from the back there, you'll see their wings cross over. It's the crossover parts that are the flight feathers. These are one of four things he says that are amazing. An eagle in the sky, a snake on a rock, hard to understand how they maneuver a ship on the seas and the way of a man with a maid the most inexperienced um, couple in the world or animals or in this case the birds these birds know things that I don't know unless I study about them uh, you take young mothers, somebody has to tell them what to do with their babies. Some things come instinctively, but many things they have to be taught. These birds have instinct, and their instinct sometimes is greater than what our learning is. Um, if you've played the fool and exalted yourself, or if you have planned evil, clap your hand over your mouth. Clap your hand over your mouth. If you planned evil, clap your hand over your mouth. As for churning, the milk produces the butter. <laughs> I've told you my dad was a country boy at heart. He is the only one of his brothers and sisters, except for the two who, child, who died in childbirth. My grandma and grandpa had ten kids. Two died in childbirth. Eight lived. Of the eight who lived, my dad 
is the only one that wanted to be buried in the country church on the property next to our old family farm. He was a country boy. He was always trying to solve things country boy ways. He didn't know how to do it in the city of Detroit where he went uh, as a young man to look for a job and look for a wife and things like that. Okay, 11. Uh, that was Craig, uh, I guess, uh, from London. He says they had to eat. Um, it's early in the morning. It's getting to be about 6 o'clock, I think. Uh, let's see. It's two o'clock in the morning uh, in London. Okay. Um, if you've played the fool and exalted yourself, or if you've planned evil, churning mother, churning milk produces butter. We couldn't get butter during the Second World War. We got margarine, and it was white. It looked like yard. It looked like lard. You could, they sold a powder with it, and you could let it get soft, and then you could smush it up and mess it up and kind of get the lard to look yellow, but it wasn't like butter. My dad got the idea <laughs> that if he, see, he helped his mom in the kitchen, but she didn't really understand the process. He knew that he turned milk to get butter. He had me and my mom and himself churning, 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 churning milk. It never did turn into butter because it's not cream. But he tried. I remember one time our dog got mange and he went to a pharmacy and tried to find out what you call sheep dip in the city so he could put it on his dog. Country boy that lived in the city. Clap your hand over your mouth. For as turning milk produces butter, and as the twisting of the rose of the twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. That's the end of chapter thirty. I'm going to close uh, our um, video. I may open it up later or tonight. I do want to talk about some practical things. Like these are more old-fashioned things, but some practical things that would help our young people or just simply somebody who hasn't had experience. And the right word, you know, might help. But as far as our video is concerned, until the next video, blessings on you.